you don't always know how good you've got it till things get worse. Star Wars, Alien 3, politics. Looking back, one can almost feel guilty for not appreciating mediocrity until we experience the dumpster fire that follows. Some people might be feeling that way about the AMD Radeon RX 5500 XT right about now. Reviewers complained about it in 2019 for its unimpressive value for money compared to the RX 590, but thanks to its lacklustre 2022 follow-up, it might be time for a re-evaluation. The RX 5500 XT didn't exactly blow reviewers away on its release in 2019, and it's not hard to see why. The old RX 480 is one of my favourite cards of all time, but every time AMD rehashed it with an overclock or a new process node, felt like their Radeon team were just phoning it in. The RX 5500 XT didn't promise a performance jump over previous models, instead appealing to customers' wallets. The 8GB model launched at just £179, about £80 less than the RX 590, and it managed this while maintaining a 40 watt lower TDP. Now, in 2022, obviously, we've seen some sht. The RX 5500 XT price briefly rocketed into the stratosphere, either because someone got an inkling it might be good at mining, or because scalpers realised gamers would pay a premium now that all the Polaris cards had vanished again. Now things are levelling off, and you can finally pick one up for around the MSRP. Mine set me back £100, because I'm a deals whisperer with a fifth sense for bargains, however the standard eBay prices are around the 150 to 180 mark. This puts it into interesting territory, it's competing with the RX 6500 XT, which is a deeply flawed product with only half the VRAM, lower memory and PCIe bandwidth, and which some people will tell you is the worst thing since sliced bread. That being said, my mission for the last half year has been to find the best option on the used market at this price point, and right now there's strong competition from the Nvidia GTX 980 Ti and 1070, and the AMD Vega 56. To find out how the 5500 XT stands up against these illustrious GPUs, I'll be running it through my usual suite of 12 games and two synthetic benchmarks on my moderately priced gaming PC, sporting a Ryzen 5 5600G and 16 gigs of DDR4. I will of course reference the results from my 6500 XT testing where appropriate, some of which was from the same test system at Gen 3 speeds, and some on an i5 system running on Gen 4. To the bench. If you had an eye on the RX 5500 XT to play God of War, you're in luck. At 1080 original settings, this card easily manages a 60 plus average with only very occasional dips below the threshold. This is basically tied with the 6500 XT at the same settings, and that seems to hold true of both Gen 3 and Gen 4 PCI Express. The one advantage, of course, is the extra VRAM might give you enough room to push textures up from original to high or ultra, though at 1080 you might not see that much of a real world difference. For people who would argue the RX 5500 XT is superior to its successor, Final Fantasy VII Remake actually backs that claim up. Averages are about the same across platforms. The game has a de facto 60 FPS cap whenever it bloody well feels like it, so the fact that some cards linger around the 60 average shouldn't be a huge surprise, but it seems like the 5500 XT handles the more demanding scenes a lot better. At 1080 high, its 1% lows are almost 56 FPS, with GPU usage far from maxed out. Curious, I did a second run at 1440 and saw less than 10% lower minimums and almost identical averages. In Elden Ring, the 5500 XT capitulates its first L to the new card, dipping below the 60 FPS cap often enough to drop its overall average to just 56 FPS with lows of 47.5. On the positive side, the visual experience will be much stronger on the 8GB card. Although both GPUs were tested at 1080 medium, I was able to push shadow and texture quality up to max on the 5500 XT, which is a big benefit to the game's overall look and feel. The 
The Forza Horizon 5 benchmarks aren't exactly one-to-one -one between the 5500 XT and the 6500 XT. I didn't have time to test it on the Gen 4 system, so arguably the 6500 XT might have more to give than I'm giving it credit for. Still, the margin isn't that big. The 5500 XT only beats the new model by less than 10% at 1080 high, and actually loses by a couple of frames at 1080 Ultra. This is, of course, the canned benchmark, and the downside to running a big open world game like this one at ultra settings on a 4GB card is that it does run out of memory from time to time. Another pleasant surprise from Halo Infinite. My testing so far in 2022 has led me to believe that 343 Industries only optimised their latest Xbox flagship title for Xbox architectures and stuff of a similar age, and thankfully that seems to extend as far as RDNA 1. Scores in single player and big team battles come close to 70 FPS at 1080 low, almost tied with the 6500 XT and far in excess of older cards like the RX 480 and GTX 970. As was to be expected, the 5500 XT wins this battle on aesthetics. Not only do you have the option to better allocate the extra VRAM, but the wider bandwidth also seems to help out with the LOD issues that plague the 6500 XT. Oops, this is embarrassing. Not for the 5500 XT, of course. 55 FPS at 1080 medium in Cyberpunk 2077 is a hell of a result, up there with old flagships like the GTX 980 Ti, and using the FSR2 mod could potentially push that up to over 60 FPS with little or no loss in quality. Check out my FSR2 mod video for more on that. The embarrassing part is, of course, for the 5500 XT's successor. The 6500 manages just 33 FPS on the same PC and the same settings, and 36 FPS on the Gen 4 system. Um, yeah, uh, this isn't good either. I'm guilty of brushing over R6 Extraction because I don't really care about the game. In fact, drop a comment below and let me know if you really value seeing how Rainbow Six Extraction performs, as I think I might be cutting it for something else in the future. For now though, the difference between the 5500 XT and its replacement is stark. The old card exceeds expectations at 1080 high, with max textures and shadows coming close to 100 FPS, and placing it alongside the GTX 980 Ti once again. The 6500 XT is about 20% slower, and also doesn't benefit from the more memory intensive settings. Splitgate is a great experience on any reasonably modern GPU, but its 360fps cap and relatively light CPU usage make it a good measure of cards in this price-to-performance category. The 5500 XT roughly ties the 6500 XT at 1080 epic settings, scoring 215fps and with a 1% above the refresh rate of a 144Hz monitor. If you're looking for a good competitive 1080 experience in Splitgate, the 5500 XT is a great choice. Likewise with Call of Duty Vanguard. Like its younger sibling, the 5500 XT can push decent frame rates at 1080 medium, averaging a little over 90 FPS. I didn't test this card on a Gen 4 system as I didn't think its x8 bandwidth would be as big a bottleneck. The 6500 XT saw a massive 20% gain from the newer PCI Express standard, so it's possible there may be some chance the 5500 XT gets a boost on newer PCs. Fortnite's a great experience at 1080 on the 5500 XT, however you wish to play. At low, with epic view distance, the card manages to pull over 200 FPS with lows over 120, if you're lucky and don't get a ton of shader compilation or loading stutter. At high settings, that drops, but only as far as 87 FPS, still more than enough for a 60 or 75Hz monitor. The numbers from Fortnite are actually spookily similar to those from the 6500 XT, so if you are hoping for a validation for your opinion that the 5500 XT is better than the new model, or vice versa, the world's biggest game isn't going to provide it. Apex Legends only recently returned to my benchmark suite after Battlefield 2042 proved disappointing, 
So my comparative results between the RDNA 1 and RDNA 2 cards isn't complete. On its own, the 5500 XT looks like a good option. Owners of high refresh 1080 monitors can drop to low settings and enjoy 140 FPS on average. Those looking to play as high can only look forward to 85 FPS, with 1% lows staying comfortably above 60. The 6500 XT was only tested on the Gen 4 system at high settings and scored similar averages and markedly better 1% lows. The reverse is true for Call of Duty Warzone, a game which I only had a chance to test on Gen 3 systems. At normal settings with high textures and shadows, the game looks uncharacteristically good and runs pretty well too. Averages of 77 and lows of 55 are more than smooth enough for casual gameplay and its significantly better 1% score makes this card a better choice for COD fans than the new model. The prevailing opinion that the RX 5500 XT is better than the 6500 XT is only mostly true. Although there's plenty to recommend the 2019 card over its successor, if you'd been expecting it to have universally superior performance than the 6500 XT, I'm afraid that isn't quite the case. What you do get, thanks to the bigger frame buffer, wider memory bandwidth and extra PCI Express lanes, is a more visually pleasing experience with higher resolution textures, better frame pacing and fewer instances of assets failing to stream properly. In some titles, the 5500 XT walks away with it, notably Cyberpunk and Rainbow Six Extraction aren't even close. In others, it's less clear cut. Unless you're on a strict electricity budget, have a cheap power supply you can't afford to upgrade, or are constitutionally opposed to buying cards more than three years old, there are still better options for similar or lower prices, like those on screen right now. That being said, unless you can find a better card for the same price or less, the RX 5500 XT is still a worthwhile pickup for gamers on a budget. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.